He is Robin Leach. This is Car Keys. I can report for this week's show that I recently um, took a week off and went to Barcelona, Spain, uh, and made part of my trip a car research um, trip and driving research trip to report here with. And it was a very interesting time looking at the vehicles, driving the streets and the countryside of Spain, and looking at the variety of brands, models, that we don't see here in the United States. It's actually quite amazing. <clears throat> you forget when you talk about U.S. vehicles all the time, which we do most of the time on this show, that when a vehicle model comes and goes in the U.S., you don't really think about where, what happens to it elsewhere in the world. When, and, in fact, that's the way I think a lot of times. For an example, which will lead me into a topic about this, um, is a vehicle that Prius, when they came out years ago, decades ago, and became the first real hybrid vehicle one could buy that got ex- extraordinarily good mileage for the size of a the vehicle then uh, as in a hybrid form and became very, very successful one of the vehicles that they brought in our models was something called a Prius 5, 5 being the Roman numeral 5, not the number 5 on the back of a vehicle or wherever they put the plaque. And <clears throat> it was a square back, somewhat of a, not quite a station wagon look, but a lot more, uh, in my opinion, practical in terms of uh, a, a physical uh, design for uh, use for both people and luggage than the slope back of the Prius line and many of the vehicles that took on the shapes as they went hybriding or hybridizing because that was one of the aerodynamic features of, of these designs uh, in adding to mileage capability. The Prius 5 never really took off, apparently, in Prius's mind or in Toyota's mind and was around for a few years and then disappeared. And, of course... I never thought much about it until I spent my week in Spain recently where the Prius 5, along with the Prius and all the other Camry vehicles that were not as numerous as these two models were, is the backbone of the taxi business in Barcelona. Um, Hallelujah for Toyota and hallelujah for the Prius design vehicle. Uh, I happened to ride in both uh, models of the, <clears throat> those two cars, of, the, of those two makes, of that make, that is. And we rode from the airport, my family and I, uh, in the Prius 5, which was very commodious for four of us, uh, along with luggage uh, required by four of us. And it was very comfortable, very efficient. And I talked a little bit about it with the driver and the drivers are obviously very, very big on the Prius or the Toyota hybrid lines of cars for uh, commercial taxi use duty. That leads you into all the other vehicles that are running around the streets of, of uh, Barcelona, and there are just a lot of hybrid versions of the vehicles that are available to those people that we don't see here. Uh, the other thing interesting about it is that There's natural gas is a a highly used fuel in many of the cars that are are running around the streets of of Barcelona, which means they are being built to use natural gas. Uh, We use uh, regular gasoline, as we know, and we use diesel in the U.S., and then you've got electric and various combinations of gasoline and electric vehicles, which we call hybrids. Over in Barcelona... All the hybrids that I noticed were diesel-electric, diesel-fueled combined with electric motors. And they go all the way up to the uh, transportation buses used in the streets of Barcelona. And just about all of the uh, buses running on the streets of Barcelona are one kind of combination of hybrid and fuel uh, or the other, the other fuel being natural gas. I saw hybrid natural gas. Uh, powered buses along with the hybrid or the electric diesel powered buses. And it was interesting seeing some of these buses all lined up waiting to pick up passengers at their various stops when they were lined up in a row. There were as many as three or four of these 
hybrid vehicles uh, lined up, and I took uh, time out in my walking around with the family to go over and walk by these buses to see uh, which ones were running on diesel and, and were any of them, while they were parked and idling, were they on electric power. And generally, when I saw three to four of these buses, one or two might actually not be running on diesel fumes while they were diesel fumes diesel fuel while they were sitting waiting passengers to board but uh, a lot of the times the diesel engines were running these buses so I was not quite sure how much electrification uh, benefit these buses were getting uh, and I didn't ride them to see what would happen uh, while I was inside the bus as far as knowing what power base they might be using all in all, however, it seems that Barcelona, and maybe much of Europe for that matter, and Jay has sort of hinted at it, but he didn't look at it the way I looked at it, uh, is very much already way ahead of us in use of alternative fuel vehicles or combination fuel vehicles, be it um, electric diesel fuel, electric natural gas propellant fuel, natural, maybe regular gas, I could not tell uh, which cars that were labeled hybrid might be uh, gasoline-powered other than diesel and hybrid because gasoline engines are much quieter. And uh, I didn't run around just spending my whole time trying to an- analyze uh, which cars were doing which. The other thing that's very prevalent on the streets of, of this city, Barcelona, and probably all over Europe, are electric uh, hybrid bicycles. Um, and electric scooters. Boy, what a way to travel around a city um, by using an electric scooter. They are all over the place. We got a rental car for one day. The person delivering the rental car to the hotel we were staying came into the hotel lobby uh, with his electric scooter and uh, because he had to take us down to where the rental car was because the streets around our hotel were closed. Uh, so they couldn't drive the car to the hotel. And so he went down with his scooter. He delivered us to the car, which was in a parking garage, and then he went back to his office on his scooter. And the same thing happened when he came to pick up the rental car, which we brought when we brought it back uh, for delivery back to the rental company at the end of a day's use. Uh, he met us at the parking garage with his scooter. He put the scooter in the trunk, uh, which we will call a trunk, because that's what it was used uh, in the back of the car. And it happened to be a BMW SUV that we had for the day, which was uh, diesel-powered. Uh, and that goes to the alternative fuel. Many of the cars that are not hybridized are using is diesel fuel, along with uh, some of them using natural gas. Diesel fuel for a long time was uh, way cheaper than gasoline in Europe. I'm not sure with the sudden rise in diesel fuel prices worldwide, for whatever reason, uh, that's still the same situation. Um, well, what about to, the shortages? There was no shortage. There's no shortage um, of diesel fuel, propane, natural gas, or whatever, uh, at least that I could tell. Um, there are plenty of fuel stations around outside of Barcelona. You don't see fuel stations inside the city. Um, and uh, we had to fill our uh, vehicle up uh, according to the rental regulations. Um, to deliver it back to the company with the same amount of fuel, more or less, uh, that it had when we got it, which was a full tank of fuel. And there was no, we didn't run into any problem finding diesel fuel or even other fuel plentifully available in Barcelona. <clears throat> so uh, I'm not sure anything that exists with fuel shortages in, in Europe at the time, or at least in Spain where we were um, at this time of uh, the year we were there. Let's go to other uh, vehicles that I saw, which I haven't seen in the U.S. There, was, there were a lot of different models of VW vans. Um, regular listeners to this show might know that I own a VW Eurovan, which was last seen in this country, I believe, around 2004 when they no longer brought them in, probably due to safety regulations and whatever else uh, made VW decide not to uh, continue to import a van, which I absolutely love, and I'm all abuzz about the buzz, which is going to be a successor to it in electric form. 
But over in uh, Spain, or in Barcelona at any rate, there are all sizes of VW vans, including uh, the newest generations of the Euro, what I call the Eurovan. Over there the, in Europe, they call it various names from the transporter, which is more for the commercial versions, as I saw, no win- windowless in that, in that uh, branded model, uh, to the California, which was a basically uh, fully windowed, passenger-capable, uh, passenger-built uh, type of VW van for uh, use anywhere from uh, taxis to uh, just general transportation. Uh, we also had sea yachts, which, were, which we don't see in the U.S., which are actually uh, an alternative VW-built van, uh, built, built vehicle, uh, albeit at a lower price point than the Audis that uh, we, are, uh, we see all over here all the time. But uh, the next thing that was most interesting was the narrowness of the streets. Of course, many anybody who listens to the show who's been to Europe knows that in the cities of many of the countries, Italy is one of them, uh, as well as Spain, have very narrow streets that were once built, which were built when buildings were built with horse and buggy type of transportation, uh, cruising those streets you know, 100 or 200 years ago, and they haven't changed. Um, it makes it very interesting to try to drive in a city uh, as an American because you have streets that are competing with three types of uh, transport, uh, bicycles or scooters, I'll, bra- I'll uh, combine them into one, cars and small delivery trucks that can fit down these narrow streets, and uh, pedestrians. And let me tell you, the streets uh, on any given day in Barcelona are packed from morning till night with people. Uh, Only the main avenues are clear of people walking down uh, in the middle of the streets because they are reserved for vehicles. They have taxi and bus lanes. Uh, They're preserved for the taxis and the buses to use if they are present in those lanes. And when they are not present right away in those lanes, they are often uh, used by uh, non-taxi bus types of vehicles, meaning passenger cars that are making, trying to make their way faster through the traffic in, urban, in the urban traffic scene than uh, they can if they stay in the strictly in those uh, restricted passenger car lanes. And then you've got the bicycle lanes, uh, which are a third type of lane that you have in many of the streets, but in the narrow. Uh, village or town, city streets, there is no uh, restriction uh, of passengers only, of uh, pedestrian only uh, people on them in many of the streets. So if you have a taxi coming to pick you up at a hotel and your hotel happens to be located on a side street uh, off the main thoroughfare in the, in the cities, um, you have to be very careful uh, as a pedestrian a bicycle rider or a scooter rider, uh, when a vehicle tries to come down that same alley type of street you may be on, walking to and from your hotel or whatever you're doing, touristing uh, other, other buildings that are on these side streets, and many of them have little shops uh, and other places to eat. Uh, you have to be very careful uh, because there's really no right-of-way type of rules, I guess, uh, that... Uh, anybody has to pay attention to. You ba- basically have to pay attention to staying out of the way so vehicles can pass if there is a vehicle coming down the street, you're, uh, the alley street you're on. And the vehicles coming down have to be very careful to allow the, passage, uh, the pedestrians to uh, be able to get, move to the sides of these alley streets so that they, can, they, the vehicles, can make their way to wherever they're going. And that can be anything from a street cleaning morning uh, Service which seems to go through many of the streets, anywhere from dawn till mid morning, uh, to service vehicles coming to service uh, something in a hotel or a restaurant or whatever, uh, to the taxis coming to pick up uh, people who have ordered taxis from uh, various places they may be staying in the city. Um, it's really interesting to watch how well it all works out on the highways. 
Um, Jay has mentioned when he's been around, he's not on this show, uh, how they are controlling speeds in Europe. And he's, of course, in Belgium many, much of the time, some, on some times, on some years. Uh, they, they effectively control, at least temporarily, the speeds uh, in Barcelona on, on the outskirts, on the highways, by the same way they do in much of the rest of Europe, which is radar, photo radar control. And uh, when we rented a car and went on uh, outside the uh, city of Barcelona for some uh, countryside travel, the speed limits were ranged from generally between 80 and 120 kilometers an hour, which is roughly 50 to 72 miles an hour uh, in miles per, miles per hour uh, <coughs> language. Uh, you had to, you could go. Uh, those posted speeds and a little higher, but every time you saw a sign which had an R in it, which was R for radar, and many of the times, much of the time, the sign spelled out the word, everybody who might have been going excess, exceeding the posted speed limits would speed right down for uh, a very short period of time, it turned out. And we, I saw this when we were in a taxi going to the airport. Uh, we were speeding along at uh, exceeding excessive speed limit signs. Uh, some of the time, and every time a radar sign came up, the driver saw it before I did, uh, he would uh, slow down to the posted speed limit for about 30 seconds and then go right back up to whatever he was doing to get us to the airport on time. And that was the way much of the driving went. When we were driving on the highways, uh, I um, paid my, uh, total attention to the speed limits, and when I could go the full 120 by, 20 kilometers an hour speed, I would but there were cars that would go by me, like not like I was standing still, but obviously 10 to 20 kilometers an hour faster than I was going, just the way they do on highways here in the U.S. Um, <clears throat> but they all were, had their eyes glued to, to the sides of the road with these radar uh, warning signs or the photo radar. <clears throat> and so that much of that keeps the, uh, most of the traffic going at the uh, posted speed limit sign or even a little below much of the time on these uh, highway roads. How out. frequent were they? What? How frequent were they? The radar? They were, uh, they, I, they were uh, frequent in some areas and non-existent in others. And I'm not sure uh, on what plan these radar uh, warning signs are posted in terms of where they are dangerous places on the highways. Uh, maybe they are more twisted, uh, meaning winding, uh, non-straightaway areas. Uh, but uh, they definitely uh, disappeared at some point along the highways for a number of kilometers. Uh, it's roughly uh, a mile is roughly, I think, 1.6 kilometers, um, translating from our miles to uh, European kilometers. <clears throat> but uh, they were they were uh, frequent enough in some areas so that you really never did want to try to make. Uh, excessive speed uh, progress on a road. You, just, you were very happy going at the posted speed limits. And these highways were two or three lanes wide in many cases. And the two right lanes, and in Europe, the slow cars stay in the right lane. The cruising cars that are not trying to pass everybody will stay uh, either in the right lane or the middle lane, going a little bit faster than the right lane. And uh, the third lane, when there were three lanes, was definitely... Uh, not used by the majority of traffic uh, in the roads that we were traveling, including myself, um, left for those that uh, seemed to want to go um, at whatever speed they thought they'd get away with before these radar uh, warning signage uh, signs would show up uh, infrequently or frequently along the way. All right. I don't know whether that covers much of the, what I was going to talk it. about. Sounds it. You've got another um, couple of minutes. Is there anything you want to add? got a couple of minutes, okay. Literally. I have a new, uh, one of my new, uh, a new version of one of my magazines, Car and Driver in this case, has come to into my mail while I was away, and I picked it up before I did this show. And uh, they have road tests on the 2023 Kia EV6 GT, which is the new performance version. The electric cars now are starting, they're already fast. Uh, many Those who listen on this show know that acceleration uh, uh, 
is not a is not a uh, problem for most many of the EVs, electric 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 vehicles that are on the roads. Um, although many of them are not particularly aggressive, but now some of the uh, manufacturers are bringing out aggressive variants of their uh, run of the mill EV cars, and. Uh, the headline for this thing, this particular car by Car and Driver says, this battery-powered uh, Kia gleefully scrambles brand perceptions, whatever readers of uh, automotive journals want to uh, make of that headline. And it's a good way to sort of summation. It's a summation before you get to the article, read what the, what the car is all about. And then there's a, um, a, a road test on a 2023 Honda Civic Type R, which is, a performance version of of uh, a Honda Civic, and um, it's a gasoline vehicle. Uh, the apex of the Civic lineup, Honda's redesigned sport compact, shares our values. And so uh, this is how they start out their articles uh, in the table of contents. contents. It's listed at the, on one of the first two or three pages of these magazines. And uh, it, you, you decide what you want to read about those vehicles, uh, by going to the article and seeing all the rest of the stuff they talk about. Um, safety. Oh, let's go to safety. Um, we rant on this show, at least I do, and Jay does to a certain degree, and I think, Jill, you agree, about uh, America's lack of perception of what they're doing on the highways uh, much of the time. And uh, that is a completely opposite situation that I've ex- experienced with this trip to Barcelona. The Europeans know what they're doing. Uh, they signal uh, well. Uh, well means, first of all, they signal. Secondly, they signal before they get to the point of what they want to do, instead of stopping, as we see here a lot of times, standing still for maybe a few a second or two, and then they put their signal on to let you know whether they're going left or right, uh, which basically effectively blocks you from deciding to try to go around vehicles in the U.S., but in Europe, they signal very well, and their manners on the highway, uh, compared to ours, are impeccable. Um, and this, by the way, is not news. Welcome it is not back. News. He is.